Welcome to the first day of CS891, which will be focusing on parallel functional programming with Java and Android. So what I'll do here in the first 20 minutes or so is give you an overview of the class, give you some pointers to where you can find the first assignment and the description of the first assignment, and then we'll also move on and start talking about some of the uh, overview of Java, particularly focusing on the functional programming features that are part of Java. I suspect that hopefully everybody here will be familiar with Java, but you may or may not know as much about some of the newer features there. So what we'll talk about today is sort of the philosophy of the course, the contents. I'll tell you how the course is organized, give you an overview of the assignments we'll be doing, which if you've taken my classes before, you know they kind of build on each other. I'll give you some hints about how to set up Java and Android using the Android Studio environment. Those of you who've taken my previous classes will probably know how to do that. And then I'll also talk about where to get the source code that we'll be using here, uh, both as examples and also for the assignments. So uh, hopefully it's clear to you nowadays that there's a lot of demand for people who know how to program multi-core platforms, being able to do parallel programs on mobile devices, on which, which today have many cores, typically four cores, uh, laptops, which increasingly have four to six cores, probably moving to eight cores very soon. Desktops, which have maybe you know, more, than, more than six cores, usually eight to 12 cores nowadays. And uh, of course, cloud environments, where you could have hundreds or thousands of cores. So this is kind of the way the world's moving. There's a number of reasons why this is happening. One of the most interesting ones, of course, is that um, Moore's law is continuing with respect to the number of transistors on a chip. So there continues to be a doubling of the number of transistors every 18 to 24 months or so. And that's gone on for a long, long time. Uh, however, the speed of each of the, the speed of the chips has not been increasing. So you can see that over the past maybe two decades, it's kind of leveled off. The transistors have continued to grow, but the speed has not grown uh, comparably with that. But the number of cores on the chip continue to increase. And that's because they've got all these transistors, so why not have more cores? So one of the consequences is you can't just wait for the next generation of chips to make your program run faster. You have to actually figure out how to program these cores effectively. And the observation here, having done this for a long time and taught this class for many years, or variants of this class for many years, is that it's not just enough to sort of think about this and read papers and read books about multi-core technologies. You've got to do more than just think about it. You really need to try it out, play around with it, learn by doing. And that's really what this class is all about. So if you want to make software that's parallel, that's able to take advantage of all these cores, yet you still want to have all these other great properties about well-designed software programs, you want to make it easy to read and write, easy to maintain and modify, more efficient or resilient, easier to debug, and so on, then you really need to learn how to use modern technologies, modern languages, modern features, which these days include combinations of object-oriented programming features and design techniques and patterns, as well as functional programming features and design techniques and patterns. So we'll be talking about those topics in this class. And you get a lot of hands-on software development expertise by the time you're done. The particular focus we're going to emphasize throughout the next 14, 15 weeks will center on three primary frameworks that are part of Java 8 even though um, Java has evolved beyond Java 8, the particular platform we'll be using will be based primarily on the features that were in Java 8, which for better or worse are more or less what's in later versions of Java as well. Uh, one of those features is something called the fork join framework or fork join pools. And that's the means by which Java programs are able to efficiently take tasks and run them on multiple cores. And we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about what a fork join pool is, and you'll get a chance to, to program with fork join pool techniques. We'll also spend time talking about something called the streams framework, which is a functional way of being able to compose different behaviors together in interesting and flexible ways. And we'll talk first about sequential streams. That'll be one of the early topics we'll discuss. And then we'll see how it's so trivial to make minuscule changes to your code in order to be able to allow those sequential streams to run in parallel. So we'll also talk about parallel streams, which is very cool. And then towards the end of the class, we'll talk about yet another approach, which is called 
the Completable Futures Framework. And this is essentially a variant of the popular, increasingly popular, reactive programming model. And so we'll learn about how to do reactive programming with completable futures, and we'll also be combining completable futures with sequential streams in order to get kind of the best of both worlds of, of doing functional parallel programming and reactive programming. So these are the three primary focal points of the course, and that'll take us through most of the semester. However, to get started, we're going to begin by talking about a little bit of object-oriented features. As you'll see in a second, I assume that you either know Java and the object-oriented features or can learn it really fast. So we won't spend a lot of time on that. We're going to spend most of our time in the beginning couple of weeks talking about the functional programming features, which originally came in, in Java 8. And uh, these are really cool. You, you may or may not have had experience with them before. If you have, that's great. Uh, if you haven't, you'll, you'll get a chance to learn both in terms of the concepts we discuss in the lectures and also the hands-on programming assignments that we'll be starting here very soon. We'll also, depending on how much time we have, whether we, we cover everything in the class with those other topics, we might have a chance to talk about software patterns. When you develop parallel programs, surprise, surprise, it helps to understand patterns for effectively designing the software to make it easier to understand, easier to maintain, easier to evolve, and so on, and in some, some cases, more scalable. So we'll, we'll reference patterns where appropriate. The great thing about patterns is they teach you concepts and techniques that are transportable across different programming languages and across different programming language paradigms. So by learning to think about things in terms of patterns, if you were to switch from Java to, to say, JavaScript or Java to C Sharp or Java to C++, the transition is much easier because you understand them at a level of abstraction that's not all wrapped up around a particular programming language syntax. So having that perspective helps you to kind of future-proof for yourself with whatever you do later on in your career. I'm assuming that you know or you can very quickly learn Java, which you should have as a baseline based on taking CS101 and other courses in that family uh, or equivalents elsewhere if you're, a, say, a grad student from someplace else. Android, which you don't have to be an expert on in order to do the assignments. It, it's kind of fun. Um, we will provide you with skeletons and shells that will do most of the Android stuff for you, and you'll plug in the Java code. But it wouldn't hurt to be able to, to know how to use Android Studio and other things, and, and we'll also teach you that as well. And something else that's really important to understand is how to use the Git reversion, uh, version control system. So once again, if you, if you need some help with some of this stuff, there's a Coursera specialization that I've created in conjunction with some faculty you may have taken classes with, Jerry Roth and Julie Johnson. And so it teaches you Java for Android. Uh, so if you really need a refresher on some of this stuff, you're welcome to take a look. It's, it's available for free, and you can sign up for it. Uh, I should also point out that I will put the slides, uh, the PDF versions of all the slides will go up on my web page, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. So uh, as you'll see, there are going to be these three main topic areas in the class. We're going to start talking about Java functional programming features. So you'll know about things like Lambda expressions, method references, and functional interfaces. We will then talk about Java parallelism frameworks, which will cover sequential streams and parallel streams. Even though the class is a parallel functional programming class, we're going to start with the sequential part just because it's really cool. And once you know how to do sequential streams, it's pretty trivial to do parallel streams because you make sort of one change, and it typically just runs a lot faster. We'll talk about the fork join framework and completable futures. And then, um, you know, depending on what we end up with, we may do some software patterns before we're done. The course has got a bunch of lessons. The lessons are composed of parts. Each part will be a single lecture. This will all make sense when you take a look at how I put all these things up on the web. And what I'll do is I, I screencast everything. And so we'll end up with the, the MP4 video of each part along with the PDF versions of the slides that correspond to those parts. And you'll be able to get them from my website. I don't use Brightspace for various reasons. I got tired of Vanderbilt switching learning management systems along the way. They kept changing from one thing to another. So I put everything on my website. And then a lot of other stuff you'll find on YouTube. I have a playlist for the class. And then we also use Git in order to keep track of the assignments and other kinds of things. So everything will be available here in this link. And I'll, I'll send this stuff out to you. I think I sent you an email. That reminds me, uh, please check your email. I sent out an email 
maybe two days ago to everybody who had been registered at that time in the class with a bunch of information that's important to know to get started. And so if you did not get that email, please let me know and I will resend it to you. If you um, are new to the class, you know, you're either shop, class shopping or you signed up late, please come and see me right after class and I'll make sure to, to send you the email so you get all, all the information. Okay, so um, there will be bi-weekly quizzes every other week. We'll have a quiz that will cover material that we talk about in class. The first quiz will be on Wednesday, September 11th. Um, you know, the first couple of classes were just kind of getting ramped up, so that'll cover everything we cover from today to the uh, September 9th, which will be the, the Monday before the quiz. All the quizzes and the final will be closed book, of course. And uh, I will endeavor to try to get the quizzes back to you by the start of the next class, which will be Monday. One of the nice things about having a, a relatively small class is I'll hand the quizzes back, I'll get to know everybody's name, and uh, we'll also go over the quizzes in class so you can find out what you did. Um, my suggestion, people, people typically find the quizzes um, a little tricky. They're not that tricky, but people tend not to like them very much. Uh, and so the question is, how do we study for them? And the best way to do that is to review the slides, which of course will be made available to you after class, shortly after class. And then I also turn all the videos uh, I turn all the lectures into videos, which I upload onto YouTube. So a good way to study is to go back and watch those lectures. You can speed them up, you know, so I'm talking even faster than I normally talk, and you can get through the material a lot faster. If, you're, uh, if I talk about something in class and you're not quite sure what I said, you can go back and watch the videos. We'll, and we'll talk about some other consequences of having the videos available here in just a minute. Couple things to note, big, big uh, issue for me is coming to class and being involved. So if you don't come to class to pick up your quiz, then you lose 50% of whatever your score was. So the, the, and also if you don't show up for the quiz uh, until the end of class, uh, you know, when we give the quiz, quizzes are usually in the latter part of the class, you also lose points. So make sure you come to the class, don't just come to class on quiz day. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a second. In fact, there's a whole discussion of the policies from the point of view of attendance and participation here, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so show up to class, be involved, no problems. I'll talk more about this in a minute. The, uh, there will be a final exam, maybe, <laughs> it all depends on various things. Sometimes we have a final exam, sometimes we don't. It kind of depends on how the final programming assignment goes. Sometimes we, we do an extra programming assignment or extra piece of programming assignment in lieu of a final. But if we have a final, uh, it'll be here in this classroom on Tuesday, December 10th from 9 until noon. And we'll kind of discuss that when we're a little further along, probably in late November, early December. OK, so let's talk about the assignments. So the programming assignments will be written in Java 8, which is what is currently supported in Android. And we'll be using Android Studio as the IDE for the development and grading of the, the programming assignments. If you want to learn about Android, and you really don't need to know a whole lot about Android, but if you're curious about it, there's a really cool book called The Busy Coder's Guide to Android Development. And if you go to my website, which I'll show you in a second, there's a link to where you can get it. It's an e-book, and it's, it's a great book. It, it, he, the guy keeps updating it for the new versions of Android. Good way to learn Android. You don't have to use Android Studio, you could use Eclipse, but your final submission has to build and run with Android Studio because we have automated all the grading, which you will be able to leverage. So my recommendation is use Android Studio. Uh, I recommend using Android Studio 3.4.x. I believe there's now, I think 3.5 just came out like yesterday. Uh, I haven't even tried using it yet, so I don't know whether it, it works with what we're doing. It might work, it might not. Stick with 3.4 and uh, that should for sure work with the automated grading that we have. And you should also use uh, Android Pi, which is uh, API 28, and we'll talk more about that in a second as well. You'll need to install the Java 8 runtime environment. You can do that by going to this link on the GitHub repository, which has the instructions for installing the software. Pretty straightforward to do this. Make sure you use Java 8, otherwise all the cool Java functional programming features won't work, and you'll be very frustrated. The um, Android Studio, you can find out more about that. I'll talk more about how to install that in a second. But that's the, ver the IDE. 
It's got a lot of really cool features. It's, it's very, very well supported at this point, very mature. Back in the day, it wasn't all that good, but it's very good and has been very good for several years now. And it, if, if we were to build apps, which we're not really building apps, but if you were to use Android Studio to build apps, you'd find it's got all kinds of cool tools. It's got wizards for making new apps. It's got visual editors for creating the graphical user interfaces. There's ways for being able to manipulate the XML files that define the layouts for your apps. It's got an emulator for running your apps on your PC, unless in case you don't have a, a phone to use. Obviously, if you have a phone, things will run a lot faster. Um, and it's got a debugger. So kind of getting up to speed with those things was good investment. Android Studio is very popular. And it's, it's all based on something called IntelliJ, which is another popular IDE that's used for many different languages, including um, specifically uh, Java. But there's also um, other IDEs from the same company called JetBrains. Please install Android 9. Uh, the next versions of Android, which is uh, Android Q, we're not quite sure what Q is going to be yet. P was easy, it was Pi. Uh, as you probably know, Android are always letters with desserts as the, as the code name for everything. So Q is kind of hard. Not, not a lot of desserts start with Q. Uh, all the source code, for the assignments, and examples that I present in class will be available on GitHub. And if you go to this link, you can clone the repository. Uh, I also have some instructions on my website for how to get Git up and running if you don't know how to use that. Great investment if you haven't learned it yet. You'll definitely have to learn it by the time the class is, is uh, about a, like a day from now. You'll have to know how to do it. And so what you do is you, go to the, you would go to this link and you would clone the repository. And then that's the version you work on. And, and I'll talk more about how you'll have to submit your assignments in a second. You'll need how to learn how to use Git and GitLab. So um, just to make things confusing, all my source code is available on GitHub, but you will use GitLab for your accounts. You'll need a GitLab account. Those of you who've taken my class before, that's old hat, because you had that from last time. So you'll have a GitLab account with a private repository. That's why we're using GitLab historically. I think GitHub now supports private accounts too, but we use GitLab, so everything's set up for that. And the way this will work is you will create a GitLab account. And then when you submit your programs, I will have a, a Google form, which I will post on Piazza, which we'll talk about in a second. And then you'll go ahead and submit this form indicating what your GitLab account is. And then I will use that in order to be able to pull your repository into my workspace and give you comments in your code and then push it back so it'll all be private. So you need to know how to, how to use this. Once in a while, we may update the repositories. Um, I try not to do this once I push things out. Every once in a while, there's some horrible bug that we have to fix. So you need to know enough with Git to know how to um, update from my repository and then keep things local in your repository. So you have to learn how to do the, the pulling from the, the master, the origin, and then doing things locally. You don't push things back to my repository. You'll push them to your local repository. Usually what we'll do, and, and we'll talk more about the structure of the assignments in a second, um, the changes usually occur between assignments. And I'll explain how all that works momentarily. The assignments will give you lots and lots and lots of hands-on experience with a whole pile of Java concurrency and parallelism frameworks and some Android stuff. But again, you don't really have to know a lot about Android. The assignments will always be available here in the GitLab account, or sorry, my GitHub account. And uh, I'll, I'll show you more about that in a second, how to learn about it. This is what we're going to be doing. So uh, for those of you who took the class I taught last, uh, last fall, or last spring, um, what we did was we had a common assignment, which was a, a real fun graphical user interface for concurrent interactions in a shared resource environment. And it was this thing called the, the Palantiri Simulator, which is really fun. And every assignment was some variant on concurrency in the context of that user interface. This semester, we're going to do something similar, but with a totally different application. So this application is going to be a web crawler that you give some URL, URL, some initial link to. And it will go from that link, and it will crawl that web page. And all web pages reachable from that page by hyperlinks up to some max depth. And it will find all the images that are available on those pages. And it will download them 
and then apply various image processing algorithms or filters or transforms, if you will, to the images. And uh, it's really, really cool. And you can learn more about how to run this in a second. But basically what it does is it'll show you icons indicating what's going on. So it'll show you an icon to indicate it's downloading. And then when it's in the process of writing the image to disk, it'll put like a little <laughs> CD-ROM writer image here. And then if you um, apply filters, it'll have this little filter icon. It'll tell you how far along it is in terms of the progress. It'll tell you what uh, transformations are taking place. It'll tell you what thread is being used. So it's a way to be able to tell at a glance whether your program is working or not. And you'll see that there's going to be a bunch of different frameworks illustrated to download and transform and store the images. And so we'll first start out, uh, the very first assignment, which I'll talk about in a second, is just having you implement a simple array class implementation, an implementation of an array interface, just to get up to speed with Java and Java 8 features. That's really simple. That'll be the first assignment. But then after that, we're going to do a sequential streams version, which will only take advantage of one thread, so it'll be kind of slow. And then we're going to do a parallel streams version, which will be a lot faster because it'll take advantage of multiple cores. Then we're going to do a fork join version of all this stuff using the fork join pool. And then we're going to do a completable futures framework version of this. So you'll get a chance to do like four different variants of frameworks, each doing something different, each one demonstrating different parallel programming techniques or, or sequential slash parallel programming techniques. And what's going to be so cool about this is when you're done, you'll end up with all these different implementations, which you can select from a menu, a drop-down menu here. And this will allow you to see visually the way in which the different parallelism models work and how they improve the performance of your code. So it's, it's a really super cool uh, assignment. And you'll, I always change things a little bit each semester, so they're always a slightly bit different from what we've ever done before, but that's the basic idea behind this. Now, this is where things get interesting. So what's going to happen here, this is possibly different from other classes you've had. I don't know exactly how things still work here, but um, what I do is when you write your initial program, um, I will review it before you get graded on it. And so I will review the program push my comments on your solution back to your repository. And then you'll get a chance, probably you know, four or five days or whatnot, to address my comments. And then you'll submit your program for, for final grading. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Some really important things. So in this class, it's important not to get behind. And so you'll see that we've split everything up in such a way where every week or so, there's something to do, even if it's not, you know, wildly profound. I'm trying to keep people so that you don't fall behind. Uh, so it's very important to submit your assignments on time. If you don't submit your assignments on time, there's big penalties. So take a look at the frequently asked questions file here for more discussions about that. So what you have to do is you have to initially submit your program for my review by the due date. And the initial submission has to be a good faith effort at getting things to, to meet the requirements. Uh, just submitting a bunch of gobbledygook and expecting me to review it and then help you doesn't work. So if you submit something that doesn't compile, for example, or it, it's just wildly incomplete, I'm not going to review it. So you need to, to take the effort to get it in good shape. And the whole purpose of this is to make sure you don't fall behind. The, there's a temptation sometimes to wait to the last minute and start things the night before something is due. So we're spacing things out into much smaller assignments more frequently so that people can do this stuff without getting crushed pull, trying to pull all-nighters. After I review things, then I will give you feedback. You'll get some time to revise the program. And then you resubmit it. And then we'll give you the final grade. Now, the other cool thing you'll see, and I'll talk more about this in a second, the, all the programming assignments have regression tests that will give you a very good idea of whether your program is working functionally. So they're very extensive tests written with JUnit and other features, things like Makito so that you'll be able to tell before you do your submission the likelihood of it working. And there's some other things we'll talk about in a second. By the time you do your final submission, you have to pass all the tests. And if you don't pass all the tests, you lose major points. So, so make sure your program is working. And the tests are a way to help indicate it's working. The tests don't, of course, demonstrate the absence of bugs. They simply show you what bugs you might have. If you don't 
um, attend class regularly and participate, you simply won't get graded. Your assignments will not be graded. So again, very important to be in class, very important to participate. Hopefully it goes without saying that your work has to be your own. There will be uh, lots of graders and TAs and office hours to help you with this. And I'll talk more about that in a second. We have office hours basically every day of the week. And uh, you should be able to get your questions answered. Try to go, avoid the temptation to, to wait until the last day and then show up at office hours. And there will be a line out the door. Try to go early. But you should get lots of help. But you have to be responsible for doing the work. This is not a team course. And that goes, of course, both for quizzes and the assignments. So you can take a look at the honor code if you need to, but it's the typical honor code um, criteria. If your code doesn't work, then you get major points off if it doesn't run correctly, if it crashes or gives the wrong answer. So, so make sure your program is working. And then there's other points we give in terms of how well you structure it. Honestly, you get a lot of skeletons, so the structure part is really pretty simple. But make sure you comment your code. One of the frequent things I will, I will say when I review people's code is make sure you comment the code. It's not enough to just to get it working. You have to understand to yourself and to the reviewer why it works the way you did. And that's usually very helpful as a, both as a habit to get into when you go in, in the real world and just to help me understand what you are understanding when you write code that's incorrect. This is a potential weighting of the different parts of the course. So. 40% will be on the quizzes. We'll probably end up with maybe 10 quizzes or so, or eight quizzes by the time we're done. 40% um, for the programming assignments, 10% for the final exam, and 10% for participation. I'll talk more about that in a second. We may vary things. For example, if we don't have a final exam, uh, for various reasons, we might make the quizzes 45% and the programming assignments 45% or something like that. All right, let's talk about participation. Really, really, really important. So there's two parts to it. One part is just showing up. Uh, I think, I forget who it was, maybe it was Yogi Berra, the famous manager for the Yankees, said, you know, half of success in life is just showing up, right? So just show up. Be in class. Don't skip class. That's part of it. And the other part is being involved, not just sitting there passively. I had, every year I, uh, I do the freshman orientation meeting right before the first day of class. So I went last night, you know, everybody starts today, their first class at Vanderbilt. And we always talk about things to do. And there's some things you can do that require you know, no talent whatsoever um, to help you be successful. And one of them is you know, being involved. And that's one of the things that really sets Vanderbilt students, should set Vanderbilt students apart from other people. Being in a position of uh, leadership, being in a position of taking the initiative. You've spent your whole lives probably taking initiative. That's why you're here. So, so don't. Uh, falter now. Okay, keep, keep participating. And that's very important. And that's also why I try to hand the assignments back so I, I get to know people, so I know who's, who's involved. This will affect your grade. So if you don't show up in class and you don't participate, you're going to lose a lot of points. So you'll lose participation points. And you can also lose points on quizzes and assignments by not being involved as well. So show up, be involved. Very important. Um, another thing, I, I'll mention this because someone pointed this out on, on the class evaluations last year. Just because we're recording these things doesn't mean I don't welcome interaction. Uh, so one thing I'll do if people ask questions, I'll, I'll try to remember to repeat them because otherwise they don't show up on the, on the recording. But you know, do not feel the least bit shy. I will, no one will be, ever be singled out. I will not say, Lucy, she took the class last year and did very well. That was a bad question. Why do you ask such dumb questions? I would never do that. Um, so make sure that you're, you're taking an active role in being involved. So if you don't get involved, you're, you're probably not going to get an A. Let's talk about what you need to do to get started. So you'll need to install Android Studio. Fortunately, that's not very hard. Um, you can download it. I, I, I made this slide like three days ago, and, and already I think 3.5 is out. But go with 3.4.x for the moment, just because you'll um, we're, we're sort of guaranteed it'll work for everything we're doing. So get that version, download it. Um, if for some reason your laptop or what your desktop, whatever you're using for your programming, doesn't have enough horsepower, doesn't have enough memory to handle Android Studio, which is kind of a hog, let me know. We can set you up in the computing labs on the second floor of Featheringill Hall, a special uh, desktop environment, which should have enough horsepower to do the assignments. Don't be frustrated and drive yourself crazy because you don't have enough horsepower. Just let me know, and we'll, we'll make 
alternative arrangements because um, otherwise it's very painful to try to do this stuff. You'll need to download and install JDK and JRE 8, which you can get from this link. I think you have to like fill out some form now. You have to register. It's kind of goofy, but it didn't used to be that way. You used to be able to download it, but now you have to fill out a form. But don't worry, uh, Oracle will not come and try to sell you uh, hardware or databases or anything like that. Download and install Android Studio 3.x, the 3.4.x, get that one. Uh, if you don't have 3.4.x, especially if you have earlier versions, the, the assignments just won't work and the tests won't work because they're built using the features of, of 3.4. Once you've got this stuff installed, then you'll select the Pi version of Android from the Android Studio SDK Manager. You can read more about that here. And uh, that will then go ahead and install everything, knock on wood. And then once you've got that downloaded and installed, then you can go ahead and create your Android emulator. And you'll want to do the API 28 emulator. And uh, this is with a virtual device manager. And you can make it look what, like whatever you want. You, know, you can make it look like a tablet. You can make it look like a big phone, a small phone. I typically use something like the, the Nexus 5 or the Nexus 6. That seems to work pretty well. If you are running on a machine, like a laptop or desktop, that uses Intel processors, then you can install this cool accelerator, which will make everything run faster for your emulator. I strongly recommend you do this. Otherwise, it's rather painfully slow to run the emulator. Obviously, if you have a smartphone, you can just connect that, and it'll use your smartphone, which will be very fast. But if you don't have a smartphone that's running, recent versions of Android, and you do have an Intel platform, either a Mac or a Windows, follow the instructions here and enable hardware acceleration. And you will be so much happier because things will go so much, so much faster. This used to be more of an issue than it is now. Nowadays, things run very fast in the emulator. All the source code for Android can be browsed here. You can download the source code for Android here. Uh, you don't necessarily need it for this course, but it's kind of cool to have around. Likewise, you can get all the source code for Java, and you can browse it here, or you can just download the Java 8 source code here. I'm a big fan of having access to the Java source code. It's really interesting. And we will actually take a look at bits and pieces of the Java source code as we go through the, through the class. OK, so to summarize things, you know, uh, you, you guys have been around long enough to know that you get out of stuff what you put into it. Uh, there's some of the work in the class will be hard. Hopefully, it'll be really interesting. I find this stuff absolutely fascinating. I'm very passionate about it, as you'll see in the material I put together for you. Um, the assignments are nicely spread out, so you shouldn't end up having to spend lots of time doing everything at the last minute. It'll be every couple of weeks, we'll be doing something. And I usually break the assignments up into several parts. So for example, assignment 1A, which I'll talk about in a second, that's the first part of the assignment. And then you'll submit it. I'll give you comments. And there will be a second part to the assignment, which you'll then have. And so we'll break everything up into typically two parts. And then by the time you're done with both parts, then you go ahead and submit the final version for grading. Don't miss deadlines. Very important. I will remind you guys of this over and over again. I will send messages to Piazza. We'll talk about that in a second. Make sure you read those things. Make sure you respond to them. The worst offense in my mind is someone not keeping up with that stuff. And then they show up and they say, oh, I didn't know things were due. I didn't realize that. It's all very, very carefully documented. And so uh, it should be easy to figure out what's going on. Make sure you participate in the discussions in class. And if you have questions about anything that uh, you don't feel like asking in class, but it comes to you at 2 in the morning or whenever you're working a project, there's a Piazza page that's all set up. And that actually might be a typo. I think it's now 2019. <laughs> so, well, I'll double check that. I'll send it out later. So the, the Piazza page, and, and hopefully, actually, you should have email from Piazza as well, because uh, I put everybody's name that was registered as of about a week ago into that. So make sure you use uh, Piazza. You can post anonymously if you have questions. Uh, I will try very hard to respond to them, or the TAs will respond to them very quickly. And um, uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but, but try to use Piazza for those kinds of things. Another thing uh, I'm a real stickler on, no laptops or phones in class unless we're doing something that requires laptops or phones. So you, you probably don't even have to bring them. Um, 
why am I a big sticker on this? It's been my experience that uh, people get distracted and so they don't actually pay attention. And then they come to office hours and they say, I don't understand what we covered, blah, blah, blah. And it's usually because they weren't paying attention. So that's the rule. I'm very, very stickly about that. The good news is everything's recorded. So there's really no need to have to have your laptop open because you can always go back and, and rewatch the videos if you miss something. So uh, do us all a favor and, and please don't do that. People will sometimes uh, try to work around that by bringing their smartphones and they spend the whole time you know, with their smartphone. It's very noticeable. Uh, either you're looking at your phone or you're in, involved in some type of prayer. And it's almost always the phone, has been my experience. So that's, I'm a real sticker on that. Um, lots of resources, office hours, tons of office hours, links for the textbooks, which you can use or not, online forum with Piazza, gazillions of links in all the slides, which you can follow to learn more things. And of course, all the videos are recorded and made available on the website. Try to resist emailing me direct, directly with questions unless they're, they're confidential questions like I'm struggling with um, you know, depression or stress. Always feel free to reach out for those kinds of things. But if the question is like, uh, you know, in, in lecture you said blah, 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 and I didn't quite follow. I'm happy to answer this question. Just post them on Piazza because chances are if you were confused, everybody else is confused too. So uh, the best way is to post there either I'll respond or one of the TAs will respond or one of the other students will respond and we'll get your answer, um, you know, we'll get you an answer and it'll be memorialized for everybody who comes later. So keeping up with Piazza is a good idea. Needless to say, you know, why subject yourself to a hard course uh, in some somewhat esoteric topics, actually not that esoteric anymore, but a more complicated topic. Why would you do something like this to yourself? Well, the reason is because there's a huge amount of opportunity for people who learn the techniques and, and the skills and tools that we're talking about. Um, most people in this class have probably figured this out already. People who, who have CS majors and who really understand the field are doing quite well these days, you know, winning the, the starting salary race, if nothing else. Um, for the, like the fifth year in a row, I think the CS majors at Vanderbilt had the highest average starting salary. Used to be the chemical engineers were the ones that were on top. Now it's CS, and it's been like that for a while, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. One of the fascinating things, of course, is that um, one reason why the average salary is fairly high is a non-trivial number of our majors tend to go to Silicon Valley, where you get a very nice, high-paying starting salary. The downside, of course, is that you'll find yourself living in a you know, 800 square foot apartment in a bad part of Palo Alto with five of your closest friends for $5,000 a month, right? So, and then you have to pay exorbitant California state tax and local tax, and, and so it doesn't go as far as it would. But if, if you go almost anywhere else, you'll get a great starting salary and actually have like a quality of life. Um, <laughs> just my personal opinion. I've, I've done a lot of work in, in the Bay Area and it's just insane. Um, but it's, it's a great field. You guys are making a really good choice by, by doing this. So that's why it's worth putting up with all this craziness, because you get a lot of great things out of it. And the skills you're learning here are things that will differentiate you for sure from just a run-of-the-mill person who, who gets their degree from watching an online course or by you know, surfing YouTube and, and watching tutorials. Really much deeper, much more interesting. Uh, if for some strange reason there's an emergency, uh, walk up the stairs and out of the building. So th there's an evacuation plan, but it's pretty straightforward. Do not take the elevator. Um, just go out, go out past Fred Flintstone's spare tires, which are those strange stone-like things out there that are apparently from the, the building construction. Okay, that's, that's that discussion. But before we leave this topic entirely, I want to point you somewhere else while we're still working on this stuff together. Uh, let me see if I can find the course website. Here we go. So if you go to the course website, which is in all the slides, you will get lots of things that you've already figured out, like where the class is and when the final exam is. You'll get links to the office hours. And as you can see, my office hours are uh, typically 8 to 8.45. Right above, right above us on the first floor of the ESB Engineering Science Building, right outside the Wondery. So you can almost always find me there early in the morning. And then we also have other people who are TAing the class. And as you can see, we've got 
all the days covered. So uh, you should have someone to go to pretty much any day of the week, and it's all up here. Occasionally this will change. The office hours are in FGH 226. You may have used that for other classes. So that's important to know. Um, there's a link here with all the assignments and the assignment deadlines. I'll show you more about this in a second. So there's the link to the assignment. The initial submission is in a little over a week. It's a very, very simple assignment, but don't procrastinate. But it's meant primarily to make sure you can get Android Studio installed and you remember enough about Java to, uh, to get things working. And then you'll, you'll submit it to me, and I'll give you comments. And then the final version that will be graded will come with your assignment 1B resubmission. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. Don't worry about that right now. Um, there's a Frequently Asked Questions page where you can learn about the course. Lots of good stuff talking about Git and other things are there. The programming assignment process and submission guidelines are covered here. I've got some discussions of what's going to be covered in the course, like a summary of the, what's, what the weightings are, what the evaluation criteria are, a rough sense of what we'll cover. We may not do it exactly lockstep with what's there, but it'll give you a sense of what we're going to do. If you want to learn about, this is, the, this is the book I recommend that you get if you need something more structured than my class lectures and the gazillions of links I give there. It's a great book called Modern Java in Action. It's how I learned all the stuff that we're covering. And then there's some things like the Busy Coder's Guide to Android Development and so on and so forth. Um, what you'll find here is there will be a week by week compendium of the lectures and the slides. And then what I have here is a walkthrough of Assignment 1A. So if you click on this, it'll take you over to YouTube. and uh, you can watch some silly ad for five seconds and then go on. But basically, this is a walkthrough that I have done uh, to welcome to the walkthrough. So that's it. That's the walkthrough, very loud. Um, <clears throat> what I do is I walk through the specification. Then I walk through the skeletons and explain what you're expected to, to provide in terms of implementation, which for assignment 1A is mostly sort of Java 7 style things, the object-oriented part of Java, very straightforward. There's also a, an illustration of how to run the unit test to make sure that your code is working properly. And then I actually show you how to run the app itself. So it's about a 20-minute video. You can watch it at whatever speed you want to go through it in 10 minutes if you want to double it. But um, that's what you need to take a look at. It's all up there. I'll be happy to answer questions on Piazza um, as you may uh, need those questions. And then the, the programming assignments will all be available here. And as I said before, you can go here and uh, clone this stuff and, and download the source code. So everything should be there. Uh, there's also the Piazza page. Please get familiar with that. And as I mentioned before, I'll send out a Google form indicating what you need to do in order to submit your code.